What's going on guys, Teddy Baldessar here. In this video, we have a long one, a video that's probably overdue in some aspect. I've done something of this sort in the past, but I wanted to do it better and more thoroughly. And that is looking at around 60 to 70 watch terms that I think every watch enthusiast should know. I don't even know the exact number because there's so many. This is gonna be a longer video, rather comprehensive. So uh, buckle up, strap in, You know, get ready for some watch terms getting thrown at you really quickly just for the nature of how long this one is going to be. I'm gonna try to go just breeze through them a little bit quicker than normal, uh, but we're looking at a lot of terms here and going to provide commentary wherever else needed. So how this is gonna be broken down, basically in four parts at the beginning, just more basic watch terms to look at, then moving at basic movement terms to know, then move into complications, and then finally looking at different finishing terms as well. In addition to that, some of these terms are gonna be rather patronizing to some that might be a bit more established in their collecting journey or just knowing about watches. So don't take offense to it. I would just rather be able to have this be completely uh, overviewing everything rather than leaving out things and having just obvious omissions when going about this process. Now, before we get too far into this, I do wanna mention, did have some amazing new releases on teddybaldasar.com of some great watches. So first, going to the new releases section of the site, you can see a lot of those. So the Chrono H, for example, from Hamilton, a manual wine version version of the uh, Intramatics that I think have some great wearability, as well as offering a bit of kind of that classic look that many people associate with the brand. Just it worked on a review, actually went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where Hamilton was based for many years. Also saw some new Rado Captain Cooks become a release, some affordable options from the Timex Q collection, and much, much more. So definitely check it out. Head over to teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of all the brands that we carry, and help us make this content all possible. Okay, so now to begin, let's look at some basic watch terms. And probably the best place to start is with a case. So a case is the central construction or body of a watch usually made of a metal that contains the movement and houses all the other elements together. Now when flipping the watch over, you also will have your case back. So the case back protects the movement and also provides access in the event of servicing to that movement. Some are closed as in made of a solid material and can be snapped on or screwed down. Exhibition case backs on the other end are transparent and allows a view of that movement within typically coming in a mineral as well as sapphire. Now this one seems pretty obvious, but still wanna mention it, thickness. So this measures the distance between the top of the crystal and the bottom of the case back and is an important figure in terms of wearability, of course. And these are measured in millimeters as well as many of the other terms around just measurement of the case. In addition, we also have lugs. So these are protruding from both of the top and the bottom of the watch and are extending out from the case, which essentially allow for a spot to attach a watch strap or a bracelet to the case itself. Now, for those that wanna switch out their straps, and this is really great if you wanna take advantage of just kind of giving your watch some different looks, then you have lug width. So this is the distance between the lugs where the strap or the bracelet can be attached. It's measured in millimeters, and usually it's somewhere between 16 to 24. That is not always the case, but in pretty much 95 to 99% of cases, that is going to be the case. You also have integrated bracelets. So this is when lug width is not going to matter. It's basically a term in which a bracelet or some type of strap is designated specifically. It's custom for the case itself. A very popular example of this is many of the high-end sports watches that you'll find from AP with the Royal Oak, also maybe from a more affordable end with the Aquas. Now moving on to straps. So this is a band made traditionally of leather, rubber, or nylon, or some other fabric material, which affixes the watch to the wrist. So don't get that confused with the bracelet. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now for deployant buckles, not deployment, deployant buckles. So this is a clasp that can be fitted to a standard leather or textile strap, often seen in more upmarket dressier watches that unlike a pin buckle, which is typical, a deployant opens in a butterfly manner in order to preserve the strap from wear. And as an important note, when looking at deployants, you can actually just fit these on a traditional watch strap. So any other leather strap that has a pin buckle, as long as you know that distance at that buckle point, you can put on a deployant strap. It's something I don't think many people think about as well as just straps in general. So it's just something to really know. Now from straps to bracelets, this is one where I see a lot of newbies kind of getting screwed up. Bracelet, metal band, it's composed of links which can be added or removed to create a custom fit while keeping the watch to the wrist versus a strap, which is gonna be made more of a separate material outside of metal. Now when talking about bracelets, we also have to look at a clasp. So this is the closure for a watch bracelet. Now this is where a number of different kinds can be included. So we have fold over, push button, and many others. This is really found in a lot of sports watches. And there's also sometimes extensions built into these clasps, whether it's micro adjustment or a diver extension to 
go over a wetsuit in a diving environment. Now, perhaps one of the most overlooked, but also one of the most important measurements is lug to lug. So this is the overall height of a watch measured vertically from, you guessed it, lug tip to lug tip. And it's a crucial measurement in understanding how a watch is going to fit on your wrist. The only problem here is many manufacturers don't actually provide this information on their websites or in their press materials, which is pretty annoying, but still very important. You can typically find it online. So then we have our crystal. So this is the transparent lens on the front of the watch, it can be found in plexiglass, acrylic, hazelite, mineral, as well as sapphire, and keeps the watch protected as well as providing a clean view of the dial within. We'll talk a bit more about coatings on these in a bit. So then we have our bezel. So this is the circle ring surrounding the crystal as well as a dial that can include markings. In addition, can also be built to be rotating, seen in many dive watches or pilot's watches out there, or could be fixed as it is on the, say, Rolex Explorer or a Rolex Explorer 2, but also has markings on it. So a lot of different variations there. Then we also have bezel inserts. So this is the circular ring set within the bezel when you're looking at more of those rotating options where the markers are located. And inserts are typically made of either aluminum, stainless steel, titanium, ceramic, or sapphire, just to name a few there. Then we have our crown. So these are typically located at the three o'clock side of the case in probably 90% of instances. And the crown allows the winding and setting of the watch movement. Some are screw down while others are more traditional push pull. So it really is gonna depend on the amount of water resistance required as well as the style of the watch itself. Now pushers are buttons or actuators located most often on the three o'clock side of the watch, typically at the two and the four that allow for operating specific functions, mostly a chronograph, but there will sometimes be functions for maybe some high complications for perpetual calendars, moon phases, and things of that sort. Now the dial is the central visual element of a watch used for indicating the time with the help of the hands. Dials can be made of a variety of different materials. You got enamel dials, lacquer dials, many different materials are gonna be used there on the dial surface, but it's not the face, it's the dial. Now to assist the dial, we have the hands that are attached at the center of the dial typically and are used to actually tell the time with a shorter hand, of course, being for the hour, longer hand for the minutes and another hand for tracking the seconds, typically set at the center as well, but not always also on the watch that I'm having right now. It's got a sub seconds on it. Uh, so Nomos Orion, that's a great example of that execution. Then we have water resistance. So water resistance is the rating of the depth or equivalent pressure a watch case can actually withstand uh, before it actually takes on water. It's typically measured in meters. And I've done a video kind of going through a bit more details on this. Water resistance is one of those things that's a bit misleading. So check out my video, eight things you should know about watches. And that will go into more detail about that as well as some crystals and some other things that are going to be helpful for you to know. Now that we've went through the basic terms around the case, let's move into the movement and look at the things there because many of the watches that we talk about here are mechanical, uh, utilize actual mechanical movements. So there's a lot to learn here. Now to start off, let's look at a movement or a caliber. So this is the heart of the watch that helps with actually tracking the time. So these can be quartz, manual, automatic, or something a little bit different and out there like the Grand Seiko Spring Drive, just to name a few here. Now, the most common movement that you're gonna find on the market now today is going to be a quartz watch. So this is a type of movement that tracks the time using the rapid vibration, I mean rapid vibration, of a quartz crystal caused by electrical impulse stemming from a battery that must be periodically replaced. Generally, it requires less parts. As many quartz watches are gonna be more accurate over a month, then many mechanical watches are gonna be over a day. So a lot of things go in favor of a quartz watch. That said, on the flip side, if you want something more traditional, that's when you go for a mechanical watch. And this is a watch that's going to utilize mechanical power to indicate the time through a use of gears, springs, screws, and other parts. And mechanical watches come in two primary types. You have your automatics, and then you have your manual winding movements. Now start with those manual watches, so also known as hand winding movements. These keep time using stored energy from a coiled spring, known as a mainspring, which requires the wearer to power the watch through that rotation of the crown. And then you also have your automatic movements. Now this is a type of mechanical watch movement as well that utilizes stored energy from a coiled mainspring to tell the time, but achieves the winding of the spring through a different process. So with an oscillating weight or also most commonly known as a rotor that will allow the mainspring to coil up. Although many automatic movements also can be hand wound as well when rotating that crown. So as mentioned, a rotor or an oscillating weight, this is the mass that moves along with the wear of a watch. Typically it's gonna be attached with a ball bearing system and will wind the mainspring of the movement with the rotation 
uh, during wear on the wrist. For power reserve, that is the amount of time a given mechanical watch movement will continue to track and show the time after being fully wound. And there's sometimes indicators for this, which we'll get to in a little bit. Now, jewels are precious stones used in high wear areas of a watch movement to resist the wear and tear caused by friction. More jewels don't always mean a better movement, just something to consider there. Now, hacking or stop seconds, this is something you probably hear myself say quite a bit in reviews. This is when a movement will actually stop at the farthest out position when pulling out the crown. So basically stop in the balance wheel to allow a user to set precise time of that second hand. This isn't always a feature in many watches, especially in even the high end, but is very nice if you wanna get precise time. Now for a base plate or also known as a main plate, this is the structure upon which all of the other movement elements are built. Really that starting function, that main plate, base plate makes a lot of sense. Then moving to bridges, these are the structural components of a watch movement that will support other elements screwed to that main plate. Now you heard that idea of a mainspring. The mainspring is housed within a barrel. This is the protective element that houses that. And a mainspring is a large spring that once coiled, either by hand winding the movement or the rotation of a rotor, will release stored energy down a gear train and powers the mechanical watch movement. Also, before I get too far into this, I'm gonna go through a lot of the details of a watch movement. But if you wanna see the actual differences between a quartz watch as well as a mechanical watch, I will link down below to the eight things to know about your watch. A lot of great info in there as well. I'd imagine just going to that video Reddit right for this if you've not seen it. Now, a gear train is a series of gears that is truly the backbone of a movement. It transfers the energy from a mainspring to the escapement and the balance wheel. Now, moving to the escapement wheel, this is a gear with protruding teeth that drives the energy from the gear train to a balance wheel, now by way of a pallet fork with an unlocking and locking motion. Now, this pallet fork is a lever shaped device that has two pallets that engage with the escapement wheel teeth. And with the help of an impulse jewel on that balance wheel will actually allow the movement of this entire watch. Now for a balance wheel, this is the wheel that rotates back and forth acting as the heartbeat of the watch movement while also providing the frequency, which will in turn provide the basis of timekeeping with the help of the hairspring. So the hairspring, or also known as the balance spring, is a flat spiral shape spring that provides forces causing consistent back and forth oscillation of the balance wheel. These can be made of several different materials. Nowadays, many are using silicon as it is way more anti-magnetic compared to some more traditional uh, hairsprings. And now for the escapement, as you might have inferred so far, it is all the components at the end of the gear train that are responsible for transferring stored energy from the gear train in a precise manner to keep time. The most popular in centuries old is the lever escapement, which uses an anchor shaped lever utilizing those two pallets that serves as the connection between the escapement wheel and the balance. Now, an alternative that you also might run into when looking at escapements, and it's pretty popular now, is going to be a coaxial escapement. So that uses a system of three pallets in order to reduce sliding friction in a movement as it's less distance traveled for those pallets and really maximizes that service interval and not needing to service as much as well as lubricate the movement. Now this was invented by Dr. George Daniels, famous English watchmaker, and his invention has now been adopted by Omega kind of lasting his legacy and is featured in many of their calibers. For frequency, this is a measure of the speed of a balance wheel in beats or oscillations within a mechanical watch movement. I've done an entire video on this if you want more details about it, but most often it's expressed in beats per hour, vibrations per hour, or hertz. So hertz are gonna be the full back and forth movement of that balance per second. Commonly hear three hertz, four hertz, five hertz, things of that sort. Definitely check out that video if you want more details on that. Then we also have amplitude, and this is the measure of the maximum number of degrees a watch balance wheel rotates in a particular direction as it oscillates back and forth. And to tie all this motion to the front of the dial, we then have the motion works. And this is the portion of the watch responsible for transferring the release of energy from the movement to appear on the front of the dial with the movement of the hands. In addition, this is also responsible for helping the user actually set the proper time manually. Then we have our third party or embossed movements. These are watch movements supplied by a company other than the actual watch manufacturer who specialize only in producing movements for the other brand. Now, some of those popular companies in the space are gonna be Etta, Salita, Miyota, just to name a few. I also have done a very comprehensive video kind of giving a lay of the land of all the third-party movements out there. Then you also have your in-house movements. So these are watch movements produced by the watch manufacturer within one of their facilities. Generally, the process is going to require extensive R&D to really develop these movements and have uh, just the manufacturing capabilities to be vertically integrated. That said, this is some 
sometimes a bit of a gray area on what really constitutes in-house, but for lack of a better term or definition, this is probably the best. Now I wanna look at some complications and complications are basically any function of a watch outside of telling the time. Now the most common complication is going to be a date complication, which will actually display the numeric date of a given month, usually located in a window or an aperture at the three o'clock position, but commonly it can be found in many other positions, say the four o'clock, six o'clock, uh, really is the most popular. And then you also find a day date, which is just going to add a day of the week to that date. Now we have our annual calendar. So this is a complication that in addition to the time is also going to indicate the day, the date, the month, and also the moon phase in many instances. It's gonna do that annually. However, it does not take into account leap year. So it is going to require you to set manually at the end of every February. However, if that is too much work for you, you can also look at a perpetual calendar. So this takes everything that an annual calendar has, except it does take into account leap years as well. So this will be good for as long as you keep it running. And typically many perpetual calendars work, at least from a modern perspective until the year 2100, some even longer. Now, one of the most common watch types as well as complications is a chronograph. And this is an integrated stopwatch function built into a watch in addition to regular timekeeping functions, typically accomplished with pushers on the side of the case that stop and start the sub-registers on the dial and keep track of that central chronograph seconds. Now for a flyback chronograph, this is a special type of chronograph, which is not gonna require that stopping and starting. Instead, a single actuation of the pusher will simultaneously restart the chronograph. Then you have one of my favorite words, a retropont, also known as a split second or a double chronograph. And this allows for timing multiple intervals with the help of another chronograph running seconds hand. Now for a couple scales that you'll find on the outside of a chronograph dial. Now a telemeter is a scale used to measure the approximate distance between a user and an event that can both be seen and heard. Probably the best example of this is going to be from modern context is gonna be lightning and thunder. So when you see lightning, get your telemeter going, when you hear the thunder, boom, stop it. And that will tell you how far away that lightning is from you in your location. Then you have your pulsometer or pulsometer. It's a scale used to measure the pulse rate or number of heartbeats over a period of time. That one pretty self-explanatory, but then you have a tachometer. And this is probably the least useful of the three. This is a scale used to measure the speed of a person or thing over a period of time. Pulling up, say, a Speedmaster as an example, say if you want to measure how fast a car was going in one kilometer. So we could start our chronograph secondhand at the beginning of the kilometer and say it took 30 seconds to complete that kilometer, we would know that that car was going 120 kilometers per hour on average. But this can also be used for different units of measurement like miles as well. And say they didn't go a full mile, you could then just use simple division to determine how fast they were actually going. The next up we have dual time. So this is a display that helps track two separate time zones on a dial at the same time on a 12 hour scale. Usually this is a separated feature with a sub dial or an indicator to display the second time zone, like with the Patek travel time for an example there. Then on the flip side, we have a GMT and a GMT includes an additional hand or indicator in a 24 hour format to track an additional time zone. It tends to typically include a rotating bezel as well that can be used for quickly cross-referencing an additional time zone as well in different parts of the world. This of course is most commonly seen with the GMT Master II family. Then for another complication of this type, we have a world time. So this is a complication that has a 24 hour scale, but it also includes corresponding cities to represent every time zone in order to see different times in the world at a glance. Now for one of the coolest looking complications uh, out there, that is the tourbillon. So this was the creation by Abraham Louis Breguet. I have a full video on this. It was invented in the 18th century that housed a traditional escapement and a balance in a cage. And that would allow the full rotation of that balance and escapement 360 degrees as a way to counteract positional air in pocket watches. But nowadays with watches being strapped to our wrist, this is not as much of a concern and basically tourbillons are reserved for essentially just flexing your horological muscles as a manufacturer. Now we have a minute repeater. So this is a function of a watch that chimes in a series of tones to indicate the time by way of internal gongs and hammers. And the traditional way to tell the time is a chime for every hour and you have every 15 minutes and then an individual minute chime as well. There also are decimal minute repeaters and I can actually show one of those. So only difference there is it's going to repeat at that second chiming uh, tone every 10 minutes rather than every 15 minutes.
Then you have an alarm. And when you're talking about it from a mechanical perspective, it's much different. This is an independently set mechanical function where an audible alarm will sound at a specified time. And also we can show a cool example of this and how this works as well with a cool JLC Memovox uh, Mariner. Now for a moon phase, this is one of my favorite complications, essentially just an indicator on the dial that graphically shows the different phase of the moon. And then power reserve, I mentioned what it is. Now for an indicator, this is typically found on the dial, but not always, but it demonstrates how much power remains from the uncoiling mainspring that we talked about within that movement. Grand Seiko is very famous for utilizing this, essentially acts as like a fuel gauge that like you'll find on your car, except on your watch, and it's pretty cool. Sometimes you'll see it on the case back as well, but most commonly will be on the front of the dial. Then you have your jumping hour. So this is a function which will have an instantaneous jump of the hour, either using a hand or an indicator following the 60 minutes passing. All right, so now we've covered a lot of the bases. We've looked at complications, basic terms, as well as movement terms. Now let's get into actual finishing of movements as well as cases, as this is another thing I think is important to know. Finishing. What is finishing? Now, this is the method of achieving an improvement to the visual appearance of a wash case, the hands, applied markers, or the movement components. And one of the most common methods of finishing a case is gonna be brushing. This is a method of finishing evidence by a grain or textured brushing on a metallic surface in a consistent directional pattern. Then on the flip side, we have polishing. So this is gonna contrast quite well from brushing. It's a finishing method demonstrated with a high level of reflected shine achieved by a buffing process. So both of those are gonna be done on a wheel, one buffing, one's gonna be polishing. Uh, very similar, actually did a video with Carson. He's a, a watchmaker. He kind of talked through this process quite a bit and actually showed how this would work. Now for a completely different execution, we have blasting. So this is when taking a case making it more matte in its appearance and is conducted by bombarding a actual case with fine sand or bead-like materials. Now we talked about crystals, let's talk about anti-reflective coating. So this is the coating on a watch crystal intended to limit the distortion and reflection that can take place when viewing a watch under certain lighting conditions. Now this can be applied in a few different areas on the top, most commonly being found on the underneath side of the crystal and then sometimes applied in both instances on the top and the bottom. Probably a most common example of this will be with the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 or say a Zen 556 or many Zen watches. Now we have PVD. Now this stands for physical vapor deposition and is a process where metal is vaporized in order to apply a thin coating to a watch case, usually in black, but also can be found in other just colors and variants, which can add a subdued look and additional layer of scratch resistance to a watch case. It's not harder than the base material, and there's a lot of detail you can go into about PVDs. I'm not gonna be able to go to all of it in this video, but it is susceptible to chipping, but it really does come down to the manufacturer and who is actually making it, because there's different just levels of its execution. So you can't just see PVD and expect the same thing from every single place. Then you also have DLC. So this is diamond-like carbon, and this is another coating technique, very similar in its execution, but is generally considered more durable and premium compared to PVD, just generally speaking, not always the case. Uh, but DLC is a harder case treatment because it has that higher level of hardness because it is based off of actual diamond hardness, as diamonds on the hardest scale, of course, is going to be at the top. All right, so now let's look at some movement finishing techniques in terms. So first we have anglage. So this is a polished beveled surface on the edge of an actual movement component, typically found on bridges mostly. Now, next we have perlage. So this is a series of circular patterns which overlap, often covering larger portions of a watch movement, like usually the base plate or the main plate. Next you have graining. So this is a method of leaving a finely textured appearance, similar to brushing, but deeper in a particular direction. It can be circular, linear, or in a sunray type effect. Now we have Cote de Genève, Geneva stripes, or Geneva waves, or sometimes can fluctuate depending on where you're at in the world. This is a series of parallel lines engraved into a movement surface, either by hand or with a lathe, and in many instances will feature a grain-like finish within. Now we also have guilloche. So guilloche is a decorated technique involving a repetitive mechanically engraved pattern resembling a braided or interlaced ribbon via engine turning. I have a video coming up with RGM. It probably could have come out after this video, just given how long this one's probably gonna take to edit. Uh, so definitely check it out. They're one of the only people that are really doing that type of stuff in America. Next up, we have bluing. So this is a method of heat treatment, most often applied to screws, but also sometimes to wash hands on the front. 
Not all blue hands are doing this technique, of course, but that turns a metal into a vibrant blue color while making the surface harder as well. And now our final definition, engraving. So this is the technique of etching into a material, commonly of course metal, into the movement, case back, or other part of a watch. Well, all right, guys, I don't even like hearing my voice that long, so I only imagine how you guys feel hearing my voice for that long, but I hope you didn't find this video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Really would appreciate that. This was a lot of just information to codify put together, uh, so really would uh, appreciate that thumbs up. Also subscribe, hit the bell icon, and uh, you know, out of all of this, did you learn anything new? I hope so. Uh, it was a lot of information to put together. Is there anything else that you can think of in the comments down below that people should just be aware of. Of course, I'll link to some other helpful videos that we've done in the past on the channel uh, to kind of just further in this, but hopefully this could be a good reference that you can come back to time and time again. And even if you're farther along in your collecting journey, maybe you learn something new here today. Also guys, definitely go check out those new releases at teddybaldestar.com. We also do have a giveaway going on as well. I think that's probably will still be going on by the time uh, that this video is posted. So definitely take advantage of that. Probably not gonna be open for much longer, so I will link to it down below. Uh, if it's closed, it'll be indicated on the form. In addition, be sure to follow on Instagram as well as be subscribed here if you do wanna see updated with just more giveaway opportunities in the future. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.